Hello and welcome to part one of five. And this is the Taranto series of Long Patrol for the 81st anniversary. And I'm going to start off by saying this now. If you watch last week's episodes, which came out about Operation MB8 and Operation Judgment, what could have happened with HMS Eagle, then if I was going to say how they would fit into the uh, into this sort of series, well, first episode of this is going to look up World War One and the origins of naval strike and naval aviation strike. The second episode is going to look at World War Two from 1939 to 1940. The third episode is going to look at the planning and the assessment for Taranto and its its targeting. So. A little quick of overview, so probably the Operation MB8 comes in after that. And then the fourth is going to look at various accounts of the attack. And the fifth is going to look at the results. So probably HMS Eagles 1, Operation Judgment, Reimagined, would come in after the results. Probably a fair assessment to put it in. Right then. First of all, but I'm going to mention this only once in this this video series. But I do currently have a bet going with my aunt that if I get enough subscribers, that's thirteen thousand by December the thirty first, twenty twenty one, she and my uncle will wear Blackburn Blackburn face masks and take a photo of it. However, I realise. It's for familial bragging rights. So this is entirely for me. So if you want to like, share, comment these videos, that's great. If you don't, I understand that too. Same with you. So let's consider the starting point. Well, the idea of attacking ships with aircraft, especially in harbour, Starts a lot earlier than most people think. A lot earlier than most people. Almost as soon as the Wright brothers get airborne in 1903, people start thinking about it. But even before then, they've been thinking about it in terms of using balloons. And this wasn't from the perspective of sinking the enemy fleet. Although, if they were wooden and you drop firebombs, that might well work. No, this was from the perspective of goading them. One of the misunderstandings about World War I is that the Royal Navy is, to an extent, surprised by the, US, uh, by the German Navy's adoption of a fleet in being, of their basically hiding their fleet in harbour. The Royal Navy, to an extent, always expect them to do that. You can read some of the earlier Corbett stuff, you can read some of the stuff which Fisher, which Richmond, which various people are writing this time. And it's part of the ideas they're considering. And they come up with various schemes and ideas for how to goad the enemy to come out and fight you. Now, Fisher's principal plan was a Baltic scheme, which was slightly different than it's traditionally considered. He wasn't going to charge the Grand Fleet into the Baltic and fight the Germans there. Although, he certainly wouldn't have objected if he had to. But he, his preference was actually to take a portion of the Baltic, guarantee access for the Royal Navy to the Baltic, and force the Germans to have to come out and confront them on the open sea. Because access to the Baltic and vessels like Courageous, Glorious, and Furious, more Courageous and Glorious than Furious, let's be honest, Furious was just weird. Courageous and Glorious for that sort of duty would mean they could get in amongst the convoys that were coming from Sweden, the supplies that were coming from Sweden into Germany. Also, 
threatening Denmark like that would force the Germans to have to send forces off to invade Denmark to try and get control of the entrance. And to cover that, they would have to uh, send their fleet out. So everything was around getting the fleet out and also blocking the Kiel Canal, which there are various options and ideas for how he could have done it. If you ever talk to Drac NFL, he would port a, uh, talk about sort of a, a submarine going in with mines, which I think is a potential option. But considering what they did with the canals in Ostend, etc., and various other points where they tried to attack them, I think potentially the Royal Navy would have had be more likely to have used old cruisers, high speed, and lots of explosives. But that is something to discuss and debate and go through. But the point is, they started thinking about aircraft from a young, earlier time to goad the enemy into coming out. And they would do this by quite simply bombing them. Yes, they might carry small bombs which can barely damage an air a ship. And probably do some work to its scantlings or something. But what they can do, and what they most certainly would do, is change the scenario for any fleet, because if they're sitting in harbour and not coming out, that's fine as long as they look impervious. But the moment aircraft are flying overhead and attacking you, the moment you are getting bombs, the moment you've got people with an impunity able to hit the harbour around you, maybe set some warehouses on fire and cause issues for the railway, you start to look weak. And then you're faced with a scenario of you either go out and fight, or you stay inside and watch your morale plummet. So Wilhelmshaven is where they start to look at. Similarity to Taranto? The approach of it is fairly open, but there is a big difference with Wilhelmshaven to Taranto. Wilhelmshaven has a very much shallower harbour than Toronto, I would argue. And well, it's mostly dependent on the Jade Light, right? Uh, but also, there is this little island outside of it called Heligoland, which the British had got in 1803. 1807, actually. 1807, sorry. And they got it off Denmark. And it was confirmed by treaty it was British. There was no German prior claim to it at all, really, in international relations terms. And yet, in 1890, the Germans put up a fuss because they worried about the Kiel Canal, but also Wilhelmshaven. Because you've got the Kiel Canal and Wilhelmshaven, and both come out and there's the island. Britain had control of it. It was an amazingly useful location. We can debate its merits and utility in World War II, when it would have been quite so close and quite so easy for air attack. But considering this would have been able to block up any pond trying to exit from the Kiel Canal, or anyone exiting from Wilhelmshaven, uh, that seems pretty useful to me. And it might have taken a lot of concrete and a lot of guns to make it strong and survive. And probably a lot of digging. But I think it would have been fairly useful to have had. But anyway, it was no longer part of the Royal Navy and part of Britain. It was given over to Germany. In 1890. By someone who obviously didn't understand the way the world worked, because it seemed sensible at the time, probably, but if you've got what is 
a exceptional strategic position to ensure that well let's put it this way as long as you're friends with germany it's fine because if germany turns around to you man this is actually part of their argument which they use on britain to get to go but but another nation controls the access to kiel canal and this because of your presence there well the turnaround would have been but we're your allies and friends we fought wars alongside each other why would that worry you should we go to couples therapy do you have some what issues in this relationship we need to work out together sarcastic kind of but instead the politicians decided to be i don't know nice and gave it to germany and therefore germany has a big fortress sitting in the way of attacking the harbors now again we can point to taranto and go well there's a big island in the middle of taranto bay but it's not quite as big as Heligoland, and it's not positioned the way Heligoland is. It's actually in the bay. This is quite a bit out at sea, and it becomes something you have to pass. And it's turned into a very large naval base, which often has ships operating from it. And I'm not talking just the little destroyers and torpedo boats. I'm talking full-on dreadnoughts. It becomes such a big problem. Even after World War II, it's considered a massive problem, and a huge explosion is used to destroy the base there. One of the largest conventional explosions ever set off. So here's the aircraft cycle for the Rock. Because after a while, the British decide, well, we can fight our way past Heligoland quite easily. The Germans haven't been coming out the sea, and there is two ways of sinking a ship one start an uncontrollable fire that will render it impossible for human habitation and damage everything so much that it eventually seeps beneath the ocean but that's pretty difficult it, you tend to hulk a ship but whether or not it sinks is a different matter or make a hole in it that lets in a lot of water now that tends to guarantee sinking a ship if you make a big enough hole and it lets in enough water. Those are the criteria. Big enough hole, enough water. Well, two ways you make a hole that way. If you're a smaller opponent attacking a larger opponent, tend to involve things like mines. Or torpedoes. Now, this is where the attack into Wilhelmshaven runs into trouble. Because if you watched the 60 second video I've done on this, again, link down below, you'll know that to attack Taranto, the RN had come up with two very important things. Fins. You can see on here but they're not as big as they need to be for an aerial torpedo if you want to really give it a good uh, chance of keep reaching the water fine and there was a very thin tension wire attached to the nose so it would belly flop into the water as you can see from this picture the torpedo is already not belly flopping in fact it's already dipping down And that is a problem, because if it's already dipping down at this point, the odds are when it renters the water, it's going to dip down further and going to go down. Therefore, the Sopwa Cuckoo, whilst the world's first naval torpedo launcher, a naval torpedo attack aircraft, was probably not going to be able to do much. However, again, it doesn't really need to do much because remember, this is the World War I period. And if you can attack even one ship, get a hit 
with a torpedo while it's in harbour. And I don't do anything with my fleet. With my whole fleet sitting in there. The problems I have in keeping my fleet's morale a viable and actually being able to go and fight a, a battle and actually be an effective deterrent go through the roof. Which more than likely has a bearing on this. The carrier chosen for the day. This is HMS Furious. Before you're saying, Alex, that this carrier looks a bit weird there. There appears to be a superstructure in the middle of its flight deck. Well, <laughs> that's because it has a takeoff deck and a landing deck. And, well, two hangars, one fore, one aft, with a center line lift and an off center lift. And basically, this is the reason why. HMS Furious is always considered an experimental rather than a true carrier. Even treaties. Especially in treaties. Because she starts off by getting the forward bit and retaining the aft gun. Then she gets the aft bit and loses, of course, the aft gun. Then someone goes, hang on, we have caused a problem here. And I go, oh, I know what, we will remove the superstructure entirely. And put everything off to one side and put in a roundel at the front. And that's when you get the carrier that is HMS Furious. As we traditionally think of it as a carrier. But no, the strike was to be launched in, by her in this form. In advantages, she would be pretty quick. In disadvantages, it's not exactly going to be the world's largest carrier strike. Which sets off a chain of thinking, because this is the origins of carrier strike on harbours of naval aviation. Not the large strikes, not the massive operations we see put into place at Midway and Coral Sea. Or even Pearl Harbor, as beautiful as that is, from the perspective of an operational technological perspective, not from the perspective of people dying. Just going to add that in before anyone samples that out of context. Multi-carrier doctrine is already being looked at at this point. That's the thing. The Royal Navy is already looking at it, literally because their carriers are so small. The experimental carriers, World War One, we don't carry that many aircraft. Even though the aircraft, in relation to what they'd be decisive in World War II, are titchy. But leaving that to one side. But again, it didn't matter. Because it wasn't about what damage it would actually do to the Germans. It was about the psychological impact of doing any damage at all. And it didn't matter if the first raid didn't... Uh, didn't cause any damage. Because the whole point of this carrier was they could land back on again. They could be rearmed. They could be launched. Again. And keep it up. Not from that far away, but again, that doesn't matter. Just far enough away that they'd be out of gun range from the shore. And safe from the minefields, but hopefully visible enough, perhaps from Heligoland, that the message reaches the German fleet and that well known font of wisdom and calmness, the Kaiser, that the British are literally trailing their coats on the coast as they attack them. Goading the German fleet, hopefully, to come out to sea to fight them. Now, the thing is, torpedo aircraft get better. 
bombs get better in the 1920s and 30s. Okay, it's not we immediately know that what it's going to be in at any point in the 1920s and 30s. So you don't, you can't sit, sit there and go. Oh, in 1932, the Royal Navy should have known not to invest in, it, in battleships at all because the aircraft carrier by this point was the queen of all the seas. They weren't. You know how you can tell this? Because the torpedo bomber is the primary strike aircraft, not just of Britain, but pretty much everyone for most of this time. And torpedo bombers, well, none of them are exactly the, the performance queens. We would like to think of in this period. They're really not. The swordfish, pictured here, is cutting edge for much of the 1930s. And in fact, even in 1940, when it launches the strike, it has, well, to use the modern phrase of its, payload, its payloads, not ships which the Americans keep talking about, the idea of it's the weapon systems it carries which matter, not the hull that it's in. Well, the swordfish is very good to fly at night, very stable for launching its torpedo, and it has the best torpedoes for the job. And most importantly, it has the system to use that tension wire to make sure the torpedo Belly flops, so it goes in flat. Only Navy in the world with it at that time. But the thing is, Ark Royal is herself the biggest symptom of all this. In other videos, I've described as a strike carrier, and I'm hoping to get my PhD turned into a book. A thesis turned into a book because that is what she is. She is a strike carrier. Her job, her role, is whether the enemy fleet is at sea or in harbour to, on the Admiral's command, deliver an overwhelming strike. For that reason, she has two hangers. For that reason, she has a lower hanger which is arguably a maintenance hangar, arguably almost her own HMS Unicorn in some respects, because of the way it's accessible by the upper hangar. But it's where you can park all the aircraft which need long-term maintenance, the ones which have issues which need to be deeply uh, need to be repaired, to allow the upper hangar to focus on supporting ongoing air group operations, to allow the air it to focus on helping get aircraft ready and keep those which are serviceable and are able to be made out ready as ready and viable as possible so that she can maintain on call a constant readiness of a strike ready to be arraigned on deck and sent off if they're in harbor well if it's a large fleet like the americans or the japanese are expected to be it'll be a goading attack still but if it's a small fleet like the Italians, the French, or the Germans, then it might just do enough damage to knock them down several sta uh, status points. Maybe even knock them out. Remember, when Battle of Toronto happens, The Royal Navy damages three of the Italian Navy's six battleships. At the same time, Germany pretty much has the two Scharnhorst and Bismarck to an extent. Bismarck was commissioned in August 1940, after all, and well, let's be honest, a ship, just because a ship's commissioned and is on paper part of your fleet doesn't mean it's worked up and fully part of your fleet yet. So, in comparison, if the RN had damaged three of the German battleships, they wouldn't have had anything available. And that was a strike not launched from the strike carrier. 
Ark Royal could have put up a strike twice as strong as Illustrious Managed. This is Ark Royal's job. And the point really from all of this is that 1940 does not come out of nowhere. It isn't a surprise to thinking, understanding admirals. It isn't a surprise to most naval officers. It's been part of the thought process, the discussions, the developments for well over three decades by this point. Right. Have you found it interesting? See you for part two.